So let's get all the important things out of the way right away. <clears throat> Almost 50 years in Westminster, Massachusetts, so I'm a New England Patriots fan. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. The good news is I went to Concordia in Ann Arbor. My first crush lived in Frankenmuth, for what it's worth. My father's side of the family are all Hoosiers, and my favorite college football team is the Fighting Irish. Right? All right, good. So you can all forgive me for the first part and just welcome me in for the second part. <laughs> so as Julie said, I was senior product manager um, for notification for TFPP. We're the manufacturing arm, essentially, of, of Tyco, uh, now Johnson Controls. And um, my responsibility is for notification, the notification piece of fire alarms, right? So there's three big pieces. You got a panel, you got detectors, and you got notification. So as I like to tell people who know nothing about it, if it blinks and makes noise, yeah, that's me, okay? Um, but as a result, I'm also responsible for mass notification. And because mass notification starts to lean over towards other things other than fire, and because I am only actually been with the company for three years and have spent most of my career in domestic preparedness, um, I also kind of pick up some different sensors and so on and so forth. So the talk that we're going to have today is going to be focused on notification. It's going to be focused on what we're doing uh, and what we're finishing up, actually our latest generation of technology, and then kind of where we're going to go. Now, the one thing that I want to make sure of this morning <clears throat> is I don't spend all the time up here talking at you because you won't get as much out of it, okay? I would prefer that we had a conversation, okay? And we went back and forth. So at any point in time in this presentation, shoot your hand up. There's a young lady who runs around with a microphone. She does a great job. And ask your questions as we're going so you don't forget them. And if we run out of time, then I'll come back and we'll talk again later. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and as far as that goes, to answer a question that went to Dave, you know, if you are with a specific university and you want to do a deeper dive into anything, it is as simple as picking up the phone, making a phone call, saying, hey, Tom, could you swing out here, try to plan it around a football game because it's that time of year, okay? No, just kidding, just kidding. All right, can you swing out here and have a chat with us? And I would be more than happy to do so, okay? All right, so let's kind of let's dig down into it now. So, notification reinvented. This has been a slogan we've been using really for the past five years. Um, <clears throat> being a product manager, y'all need to understand that if you love the product, it's because of me. If you don't like the product, it was all R&D's fault, yeah. okay? All right, so. We have been building a new product line now. This is supposed to be a two-year project, and we've been working on it for five years, Dave. Almost six, okay? Now, there's the, you know, that's another good news, bad news situation. <clears throat> One of the things is, it was kind of like NASA putting a man on the moon, all right? Yeah, and I'm not saying that it's equal to putting a man on the moon. What I'm saying is, is the amount of effort that went into it is more than anybody really expected. And the reason is, is because... The notification technology that we have been developing and beginning out in the field, nobody else does this stuff. Uh, and and that's, that's the honest truth. There's nobody else that does, uh, has product that is similar to the simplex line of notification appliances. We do things that every, other people haven't even figured out yet. And because we're kind of blazing new ground, it has taken a little bit longer than we originally expected. Our new family of notification devices are called Truler ES. Don't ask me what the ES stands for. Some cool marketing person put ES next to it, and then later on we tried to figure out what we could call it. Uh, couldn't figure it out, but ES stuck. But what it really boils down to is, this is addressable notification. So raise your hand if you have an inkling of what addressable notification is. Ooh, oh man. Now nah, I'm really gonna have to work for my money. Okay, so for the rest of you, <clears throat> basically addressable notification is notification that is, well, it's not self-aware, right? But it knows who it is. It knows who it is within the whole scheme of things, within the system, within the programming. So when it comes to operation, you can actually get a single device to do what you want it to. 
With a traditional fire alarm architecture, you were really limited to circuit by circuit function, okay? So if I wanna make that speaker strobe flash and make noise the old way, I would have to set off all the speaker strobes that were on a circuit, right? Piece of wire goes all the way out, a bunch of appliances are attached to them, goes all the way back in, all right? That's the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is a piece of wire goes out, a bunch of appliances are attached to it, and the programming says, I want you to flash, or I want you to make noise. That's addressability. And there are some huge advantages that come with that, not just from the fire alarm operational standpoint. We pointed out here on the slide, lower costs through more efficient wiring. Any engineers here in the room? All right, great. So class A, traditional, right? Loop goes out, comes back. With addressable notification, you can do what they call class B circuits. It means you run the wire out and there is no return on it, all right? And the reason that we can do that, and we do that without an end of line resistor, is because the, each of the notification devices is addressed. In other words, it's kind of like your computer with an IP address, right? Very, sim very similar to that, which means you can cut down on the amount of wiring. And because we redesigned these from scratch, we redesigned them with different power characteristics so that you could use smaller wiring. Now that might not mean a lot to a lot of folks, but if you're the guy who has to haul all that cable through a ceiling or through a conduit or through a little pipe, right? Cutting down on the size of that wire is a great thing. Also costs less. Hands-free, unobtrusive, on-demand scheduled testing for every appliance. What does that mean? Raise your hand if in the last year you did a fire alarm test in one of your buildings. <clears throat> Raise your hand if that building was occupied when you did it. How do the people feel about being in the building that's occupied when you're doing a fire alarm test? This guy's laughing over here, right? Because he knows. He knows exactly what it's like. Remember when we were all kids? Okay, how did, how did they test the fire, fire alarms at the elementary school, right? Whole bunch of firemen came, right? And if you lived in a smaller community like mine, it was the whole volunteer fire department. So you got like 20 guys, they come in, they yank the pull station, they take advantage of that to do a fire drill. So all the kids, we get a line in the hallways and we all go marching out and you get recessed for like 45 minutes. It's like an early Christmas break, right? Because recess lasts forever. Why? Because now the firemen have to go all the way through the building and they have to individually check every single one of those fire alarm devices to make sure that the light is flashing and the horn is going off, right? And what are the teachers doing at the end of the 45 minutes? They're pulling their hair out, right? They're like, oh man, can't we get back inside, okay? Addressable notification, you don't have to do that anymore. We have what we call self-test, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a second. But essentially, you can go to the panel and you can say, run the self-test. And here, eh, pff, that's it. It's done. All done. No need for the kids to go out on the playground. Actually, no need to disturb anybody, right? No need to disturb anybody, and you don't even have to be there to do it. But more on that in a second. The appliance testing, logging, reporting. Easier troubleshooting. Why is it easier to troubleshoot? Because the device is intelligent. If it's broken, it will tell you. That's pretty cool. All right, moving right along. We talked a little bit, I talked a little bit about the power efficiency. We won't walk all the way through this slide. Suffice it to say, we have more power available with TrueAlert ES. If you have more power available, that means you can go a longer distance and put more stuff on it, right? And that's really what it all boils down to. Why is that important? Because you don't have to run another circuit. If you don't have to run another circuit, that means you get to save more money, right? And it makes it a whole lot easier to design as well. All right, here's just a real quick example, not to get in the weeds. Everybody take a look at what this says right down here in the bottom, because that's really what makes sense. On the let me turn around. Left-hand side. On the left-hand side is a, this is an elementary school, all right? And that's the way it was designed conventionally. On the right-hand side, that's the way it was designed with addressable notification. You will notice on the conventional side, not only did we have to deal with the panel, but we had to put repeaters in there in order to get our power and our signal all the way out to where we wanted to. More repeaters, it all adds up, costs money. On the other side, wow, son of a gun didn't need any repeaters. We cut down on the length of the wires because they were using the class B and doing what they call T-tapping, which it's like a Christmas tree. 
I think that's really the best analogy for tea tapping. You run your lights up the Christmas tree, you get to the end, you got a plug, you plug something in and you go off in a different direction, right? That's, that, is, that is tea tapping for Christmas trees. With a fire alarm, it means you run that circuit out there and you come off of it like this, okay? Can't do that with conventional, only with addressable. And it lead, led to a 50% reduction in the cost of the wiring, in the wiring material, I should say, 20% less NAC wiring, 50% fewer connections and batteries, and 77% fewer NACs. They saved money. Not only did they save money, they ended up with a better system that does self-test and all the other wonderful things that we are going to talk about. So, a lot of people ask this question, our AHJ guy over here, right? A lot of people ask the question, yeah, but this self-test, it sounds really cool, but does NFP allow it? NFPA absolutely allows it. And this is one of those, I'm going to use this as an example for this gentleman over here who was asking about being on committees, right? Can I have some influence? Can I help drive? Well, from the manufacturer's side of thing, this was our influence. Hey, NFPA, we've got this great new technology. We're going to prove it to you. And we hope that you're going to allow it in the standard, and this is essentially what the outcome is. We proved it, they liked it, it's in the standard, it is allowed, okay? But we were talking about self-tests earlier, right? So from a conventional standpoint, all those circuits need to be tested together. From an addressable standpoint, we've built sensors into the devices for sound and for light, okay? So when it makes noise, when it flashes, the sensors can tell that that's functioning, and it reports it back to the panel. Right? So it's confirming whether it, the, the function is still there. That doesn't preclude, by the way, the necessity for still walking around the building. All right? Because let's take a dorm, for example. All manner of things could be hung on the fire alarm notification device inside the dorm. Right? Not all of them we even want to talk about here. But it's necessary to go and make sure that they haven't been obstructed that that last contractor you had come through didn't paint them over or, you know, or anything like that. So that physical inspection is still necessary. But the functional inspection, the one that drives everybody absolutely nuts because it's so disruptive, now happens in an instant. It's a little exaggeration, okay? It's a flash, it's a buzz, then it takes a couple of minutes depending on the size for all the messaging to get back to the fire alarm panel. But when you get back there, you can get a report that tells you exactly if your system is functioning or not. And then if something isn't functioning, it will tell you exactly what it is, which means you don't have to go tracing through an entire circuit to find out what's broken and what's not. So you can do this manually. You can walk up to the panel and you can enter a command and you can say, run the self-test. Right? You can walk up to the panel, you can enter a command and use what I refer to as the magic wand for all you Harry Potter fans, right? Same kind of thing. You walk up to the device with the magic wand, it literally looks like a magic wand, and you hold it up to the device and it's magnetic. There's a little reed switch inside here and it flips it and it tests and it runs the diagnostic on just that device. So if you're trying to troubleshoot, right, you can, you can, um, you can use that method as well. The best thing is, is it can be automatic and scheduled. We have some Simplex Grinnell people in here. R raise your hand if you work on these systems. No? No, just selling them, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And um, the scheduling thing, the, I'm going to use this as an example of, you know, kind of learn from what you do and go on and improve. Because one of the other points that I want to drive home this morning is, is uh, Tyco Fire Protection, Tyco, now Johnson Controls. I'm, I'm really still getting used to that, you'll have to forgive me, right? We say we're an innovation company and we truly are. So in other words, when we release something, we're really not done. Another reason why this project has taken much longer than it was originally intended. When we put together the self-test, the technicians had to do, in order to get that scheduled self-test, they had to write lines of code, kind of like doing HTML, okay? Um, not very user-friendly. And uh, a whole lot of folks called me up and said, you, you have got to do something about this. So we did. We actually built wizards. It's like Outlook, right? And it said, this is what I want tested on this day using this calendar and this time and date stamp. Go, right? And then the panel remembers that. So when it's the middle of summer and there's no students, right? And there's even less people to disrupt, even with a single flash, at midnight, that thing can run. 
and your facilities guy can come strolling in the next morning and say, give me the report. How did we do last night? And you can do that as often as you could do it every night if you wanted. Okay. So another great advantage of self-test and how it's used. Okay. So let's talk about the 520 for a little bit. So Dave already gave you the whole scoop on the 520 notification appliances. And he was absolutely on spot with everything he said, um, including that this is really good for elderly people and this is really good for very young people. And all of you are thinking, but I have a whole bunch of late teen 20 somethings. The thing he didn't mention is it's really good for intoxicated people. And, and, and okay, I, 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 I may not be politically correct here, but I also went to college at one point in time, okay? Um, so that is actually another benefit and frankly, a, a good serious benefit of the, of the low frequency, the 520. And Dave showed you all this. I want to let you know that within our product line, we have a couple of different things for you to choose from. If you decide that you want to use 520, uh, Hertz notification. Okay. And the first of which, and, and this was a generational kind of thing. Because you remember he said that date, that January 1st, 2014, remember? So January 1st, 2014 came around and the entire fire alarm industry went, huh, oops, right? Um, because, and it wasn't just us, it was everybody. And we all turned around and we went 520. We've got to have a 520 appliance out there? Oh, nobody's going to be worried about it because they're still using 2009, right? But unfortunately, there were plenty of folks out there that jumped on it right away, okay? So we moved very quickly. We already had a uh, fire alarm audio system. So the first thing that we did was work with UL. We were the very first to do this, and we got our audio system tone approved by UL as meeting that requirement, okay? So we moved from there into our multi-tone device. That was the first purpose-built appliance that we did for 520. And a multi-tone plays the 520 and it plays a chime and it plays a whoop siren. It'll play all kinds of things, right? It's all dependent on what you want to use it for, which by the way, can be used for multiple threats within the system, right? Here's another, here's another little tidbit that I want to drop on you. If, you th if, if we're still using the term fire alarm, system, right? In 10 years, I'll eat my hat. Okay. Because it's all about life safety. Now it's not just about the fire threat, right? It's not just about the fire threat. There are so many other threats. We're going to talk about one of them this afternoon. There are so many other things that impact the people that we're responsible for protecting their life, their safety, our property. All right. So that's, that's really important to remember. So we did that multi-tone. We moved from the multi-tone to our new addressable speakers, which I'm going to talk about in a minute because I'm really excited about them because talk about dealing with multiple threats at the same time. So the moral of the story is Simplex, the product, Tyco, the company, has lots of different solutions for 520. And all you need to do is sit down and talk to us and we can work together to find the right solution for you. Did that sound like a commercial? It did, didn't it? I know. It's terrible. And I'm not a sales guy either. Okay. So this is a fun story. These are LEDs. Um, there's Arabic written on the top of some of those, right? And so let me explain why there's Arabic written on the top of some of those pictures. So we had a really, really, we have still, we've got this really brilliant engineer in our R and D uh, group in Westminster, Massachusetts, which designs all this new stuff. And he was like, you know what? I think that we can use LEDs, right? In order for strobes. And if we use LEDs for strobes, we're going to be able to make them a lot smaller because one of the things, let's face it folks. Okay. It's kind of hard not to miss that. Okay. Beautiful, gorgeous room like that. Wonderful, beautiful, well-functioning fire alarm piece right here. Okay. But you know, aesthetics, aesthetics count, right? So if we could use an LED, we didn't have to use that big old strobe. We could shrink everything down. So off he went and, and it literally was, we took, we let one guy with an idea go and, and work on it. And he came back faster than the teams do go figure. And he came back and he said, I got it right. And we ended up with these and everybody, and I was kind of looking at it. I'm like, okay, it's a little more expensive uh, than the other stuff that we have. And NFPA hasn't said anything about LEDs yet. 
So do I really want to sell them in the United States and then find out that NFP is going to come along, make some new rules, and then I'm going to have to react to that? Or should I sell them someplace else where they're not as interested in the rules, our rules anyway, right? And far more interested in aesthetics. Yep, the Middle East, right? And since I'm responsible globally, that's exactly what we did, which is why we have those up there. But eventually, NFPA did come out, and that was one of the things that Dave mentioned in his presentation when he was talking about Paul Swift. And here's where, this is where I like to brag, okay? This is the bragging part, all right? Another company who shall remain nameless, right, but who sells a lot of notification devices, all right, came out with LEDs first. Ooh, we've got them. This is really good. And they came out with LEDs first because, well, I don't think they were planning for the future that well, okay? Now, everybody know what a candela is? Okay, candelas, okay, candela ratings. It's how bright the light flashes, okay? So it goes from 15 to 185. And then that pulse width Dave was talking about, that's how fast the light flashes, right? So what the NFPA decided was, is it needed to be equal to, right, the same notification ability as a traditional xenon strobe. And so that pulse width is 10 milliseconds. That's wicked fast, as we say in Massachusetts, all right? It's 10 milliseconds, all right? So my buddies out there had strobes out there, but they were 100, 100, uh, between 100 and 200 milliseconds. And the NFPA came out and said, nah, it's going to be 10. This is why I didn't build them for the United States first, right? We, on the other hand, were smack right at 10. Now, why am I bragging about this? All right, LEDs, where do you use LEDs? Who's got them in their house? I bet you do. You know, who's gone down to Home Depot, bought those new bulbs, right? That drop practically no power at all and have the effective lighting of, you know, 75 watt bulb or, you know, right? Okay, those are LEDs. If you've got those really cool blue lights on your car, right? The ones that everybody else hates because they're coming in the other direction, right? But they're great for you because it lights it up like daytime, that's LEDs. Now what's wonderful about LEDs is they don't draw much power. That's what the technology was designed for. They don't draw power, but they start up slowly. Slow being rel a relative term, right? When an LED gets turned on, it goes right? When a xenon flash strobes, it goes All right, did I hit you? Okay, good, I'm glad, just checking, okay? Just checking. So the trick was, is could we make an LED go right? And that's that 10 milliseconds, and we did, and that was really, really, really hard to do. But we figured out how to do it. We broke a whole lot of LEDs figuring it out, let me tell you, okay? We figured out how to do it, all right? We got that 10 second pulse width that we needed, and not only did we do that, but my other friends that are out there, they managed to get to 110 candela, all right? And we got to 185 candela, which gives you the full range that you need for all your applications. Because when you're starting to talk about that smoke blanket right up towards the ceiling, you need that higher candela to meet the code. All right. So this is, again, it was a great innovation. This is the really cool part. Everybody kind of recognizes this profile, right? Right, Shh, don't say the name, it's against the rules, right? It's against the rules. But most everybody's got one of those in their pocket. That's to scale, that's to scale. All right, admittedly, it's the big one that my kids carry around in their back pocket that looks kind of like a laptop held up to your head. But still, that is still a great, great, it's an incredible size reduction. Again, that full 15 to 185 range, the flexibility and power. The other cool thing is, is it's got all this new technology, but it's got all the same True Alert ES stuff, right? Which means it's just in a much, much smaller package. Kind of like taking a Cadillac and making it into a Porsche. Right? I didn't, I'm not saying it costs as much as a Cadillac or a Porsche. Not close. Well, okay. All right. All right. Okay. So here we go. It's the only LED UL strobe approved to sync with xenons on the same circuit. Why is that important? For you people who are constantly doing the retrofits, right? When you just want to kind of do one hallway or you're going to go a hallway at a time, it's really important that these will actually sync with the xenons, right? Otherwise we have that same problem with the flashing, right? Uh, and the seizures, and my sister's got the, uh, what is it, multiple intermittent temporary blah, 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 multiple sclerosis. And so when the strobes go off, she gets a debilitating headache that drives her right to her knees. 
So I was, I was personally aware of how important that was. Our strobes are the only LED strobes on the market that can sync on the same circuit, right? If you go with anybody else, you gotta run a separate circuit for them. You can't mix and match. We can do that. Now let's talk about sound, right? Big voice. This is in homage to my friends and our partners over here at, um, at Hyperspike. All right. But before we get to Hyperspike, which is the big, big sound, let's talk about the little sound that sounds so good. These are our new speakers. All right. One of my kids uh, actually calls them uh, the Enterprise speakers because she thinks they kind of look like the saucer section of the USS Enterprise, or at least one of the versions of it. Um, and a lot of people say, why did you do such a weird design, right? What's with this asymmetrical design? This is what's with it, folks. If you remember the picture before, there was a speaker like this and it had a big old strobe right on top of it, right? There's a lot of folks that have that configuration, speaker, big old strobe on top of it. How many people stick a big flower pot right in front of the speakers in your living room? No, you don't. Why? Because you don't get all the sound out of it, right? So you move the flower pot. This is exactly what we did here, right? We moved the strobe off to the side. That solved two things. One, it makes people curious because it looks, frankly, weird as compared to everything else they've seen in the past. So it's at least something to get the conversation started. Two, two, it moves the strobe away from the speaker, which is really important because I wanted high performance, high quality sound. I don't mean like the, you know, Mrs. Jones, can you please send Joey to the office, right? We don't need a speaker like that. I wanted something that would be equally good for that. And if I was in a gleeful, joking kind of mood, I could play, I don't know, little Led Zeppelin or Aerosmith or something, and it would sound almost as good as it does at home. That is bragging because we're really close to that, as you'll see in a minute. I also wanted something that we're gonna be able to get closer to the ceiling, right? Because in my opinion, a lot of the old stuff hanging from the ceiling looks like cow's udders, right? I mean, there are these big drop down things going all over the place and by moving it to the side, we could shift it all up. So we did all that stuff. We put the self test in it. We've got all the other advantages we just talked about with the True Alert ES with the wiring and so on and so forth. And it's got this killer, killer audio performance, okay? And you really gotta hear it to believe it because right, you're not gonna you're not gonna believe me I want to tell you about the audio performance on this thing F frequency response right so frequency response is one of those ways that you gauge the quality of sound okay and if you take a look and that's usually measured in uh, Hertz or fractions of Hertz and if you go all the way down to the very bottom of that spectrum right around 200 and below 200, it starts to get below what the human ear is going to pick up, but you still get to feel it. That's the base, okay? That's your base all the way down there. You ever pull up to a stoplight? Must happen a lot around here in a college town. Car pulls up next to you, it's going boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, right? And your whole car goes right? Okay, that's because it's all the way down there on the low end of the spectrum. That's the base. On the other side, right around 13,000. Um, that's the real high end of the range. And 13 to 20, right, is it's, you feel it again, but it's a different feeling. Like when you go to an orchestra and you can feel the trumpets and you can feel the cymbals, you know? All right? So that's the high end of that spectrum. So the whole idea is, is grab as much of that spectrum as possible. Now, again, we're not allowed to use names, right? Brand names and so on and so forth. But let me put it this way. I went out and I went out on Amazon and I picked out a couple of very popular home stereo theater systems. Okay. The other thing I picked out was a couple of really popular sound systems that are used by gamers, right? Because kids, that's what they do now and they want really cool sound to go with their really cool games. And then we took a look at what their specifications were. Our speakers, right? And I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say what the brand is. I wish I could, but it, but, but it might start with a B. Anyway, our speakers, right, if you take a look at that frequency range, right, we are just inside of it on either side. Nobody's ever come close to that with a fire alarm. In fact, we expanded that range um, by 4,000 hertz over the competition, right, which is, which is amazing. So you need to have Dave come over 
and demonstrate this stuff, you, you, I'm serious, you, you really do. The first place we put them into is Boston. It's a high rise, uh, Dalton Street, high rise condominium complex, luxury condominiums, put the speakers in. I got a phone call, I was on the road, I got a phone call that day and, the, and they had the authority having jurisdiction, the fire department, a whole bunch of other people, they're like, we couldn't believe it. We absolutely couldn't believe how good these things sound. Now, why does that make a difference? Who cares, right? Who cares? Why spend all the money on a new building and putting in an audio fire alarm system and never having it go beep, right? Because you hope it never does. But wouldn't you like to be able to use it for other things, right? And you can. So you can use it for paging purposes or public address purposes or background music, right? I mean, some nice soothing background music to get the kids to calm down during finals time, right? There's so many, there's so many other things that you can use it for. And because it's addressable notification, you can individually target the speakers. All right, so here's the caveat. Let's say we're using this for, I don't know, a tornado, right? Tornado's coming in. So you can have a message that says, tornado's coming, these are the things that we want you to do, right? you could have a active shooter. And the message for an active shooter, depending on where he is, for some people might be barricade yourself, for other people it might be evacuate, right? And, for other, and there might be some areas that you don't want to send a message to at all because you actually don't want the active shooter to know that you know, right? And the people that are there, they already know, right? They don't need the fire alarm system to tell them that, right? And we don't want that whole kind of thing going where, you know, you yank it and, and the people are running out. By the way, that example, those are preteens that did that. Yank the pirate fire alarm, 13, 12 years old, shooting people as they're coming out of the school. Okay. Um, so the great thing about addressable notification is, is you can target the messaging where you need it. Okay. You can target the messaging where you need it, when you need it, you can break it up. There is a limitation because this is not what they call multiplexing, all right? And what that means is, is we can send different messages out simultaneously on different circuits, but we can't send different messages simultaneously on the same circuit. So from a programming cas point, that means you've got to cascade the message, right? So if all, if my first, second, and third floor are on the same, on the same um, circuit, then I have to say, play this message up here, and after that command goes out and it's done, then I have to move to the next one, right? So that's the limitation right now from a, from a, a granularity of control standpoint. Let's talk about big, big sound. Did everybody have a chance to go over and look at that white thing over there? Looks kind of like a flying saucer kind of doohickey. That is an Omni speaker. Now, why is that such a cool thing? That is such a cool thing because in order to get the kind of sound that you get out of that Omni speaker right, at 50, 100, or 150 watts, right? Just making sure. In order to get that kind of sound, it used to be you had to take a big pole, right? And you had to put a bunch of different speakers pointing in different directions. That adds up, right? Bunch of different speakers means a bunch of different checks that need to be written for all those speakers. That thing spreads it right out spreads it out beautifully and the quality of sound is incredible because, and I will have to admit, the best audio engineers in this industry, the best audio engineer, singular, I should say, works for the company that designed that for us and we're the only people that have it, okay? All right, so what's the other great thing? You can pick that up. Anybody here in this room can pick that up. Now, some of the other speakers out there, it takes two men, a boy, and a horse winch pulleys right to get all that stuff up there it's very lightweight another cool thing it's indoor outdoor right so if you've got a small facility right that you want to cover and you need mass notification in it or you need mass notification outside of it you can use the exact same speaker so let's say you want to cover a playground a small ball field whatever the case may be that speaker is probably the one for you then they get a little bit bigger and a little bit louder all right, and the important thing here is, is there is a family of these things that progressively can really start to project out. The, do we have a picture? No. Um, but the MA1 and the MA2, we just added to the line. Take a look at this, usable range of 1.5 miles, mounted at 25 feet, okay? Now, when they mean usable range, I, from personal experience, can tell you that they have tended to underestimate 
um, the ability of their speakers to project. Um, we did a demonstration of a different speaker that's here out the back door of our headquarters building, actually our manufacturing building, pointed at the woods. Nobody is there for five miles. Through the woods, across the lake, more woods, and then the high school that I went to school with. And unfortunately, the joker who decided to do the demonstration for us played a demonstration message that they used with the US Navy, something alongside, do not come along this craft, we're prepared to fire, okay? <laughs> Guess who heard the message five miles away inside the school? Right, one of our engineers gets a phone call from his daughter. Daddy, are you guys doing something really weird over there? All right, okay. What I'm saying is, right, what I'm saying is, obviously you don't have to worry about that kind of collateral messaging when we come in and engineer a system and put speakers like this up. But what I'm saying is, is can you imagine how great the technology has to be for somebody to hear a message inside a building in a high school even, right, over a five mile period? You know, even, even if it was perfect acoustical, you know, weather conditions or whatever the case may be. It's awesome, awesome, great technology. Okay, so here's the but wait, there's more part. You see one of these going over there. We're actually coming out with a new version of it. It looks a little smarter. Um, but more importantly, it has, just like this one, it has all of the same um, uh, characteristics. Uh, as the rest of the addressable notification does. It does not have self-test, however, right? So what are things like this for? This is where we are going to talk about how we can use fire alarm stuff, right? Your investment in that to deal with other issues, right? They can be life safety issues. They can be day-to-day -day issues. By the way, there's absolutely no reason, technically and theoretically, that that sign can't say, Pizza's the special in the student union. It can. Why not? Why not? Right? All right. If you're not, if it can't always say shelter in place, unsafe condition, that would freak out everybody, right? And, and you actually want people to know that the signs are there. You want them to get used to being able to see these things. So that when this thing goes, right? people tend to look up and say, oh, there's a sign. Oh, it's gonna tell me what to do, right? right? And that also helps for the people like me that are hard of hearing. I might hear the <clears throat> but I might not get the message that comes across. You never know, right? So this is great for that. Um, so that is my intro into the, let's talk about what else we can do and what other, we're, we're going with some technologies. This is brandy new, this is TrueCom, and this is our area of rescue, area of refuge product. Now the building code says that you gotta have one of these things, right, in each stairwell, and I think elevator lobbies? Is it ele ele elevator lobbies, right? So you may have seen these around, especially in apartment buildings and so on and so forth. And basically, here's the old function. This is what they said it needed to do. You can't get out of the building because you're in a wheelchair or you can't navigate the stairs. And of course, you can't use the elevator because there's a fire. Right? So you go up and you hit the button, right? And then down at the fire alarm control panel, there's another panel and it lights up. And the fire department, hopefully is there by that point in time, sees it light up and they hit a button and it connects the two, kind of like cans with a string, right? That is literally the, the way that the vast majority of things that are out there work. And the fire department can say, we're here. And the person can say, help me, help me. And, and hopefully they put the two of them together right and they get the person out all right there's got to be a way to improve over that so we did all right so we did so first off we're really fond of things that are addressable we made this entire system addressable we made this entire system supervised we made this entire system digital we put call cards in the whole thing which is communication think of it as putting a cell phone card in the boxes that way, if the fire department hasn't gotten there yet, from their laptop, from their command vehicle, from the engine, we used to have tough books in our engine companies, right? The app can pop right up and say, there are people here before they even show up. That's super cool. That's super cool. The other thing is, is this is networkable. So where all the other ones are kind of home runs, home run means that this is the head end and all my little stations are out here and they all got to come back to that head end. This, you can network together up to 32. Dave, is that correct? I should know that, 32, right? 32 master stations network together? 
Yeah. All right. So that means you got to have a really big facility because I'm hanging 32 of the call stations off of each of these. So 32 times 32. I wasn't really good with math. Somebody else can do that. Okay. It's a lot. It's a lot. All right. So it is currently, this is, this is to the best of my knowledge because it could have changed in the last couple of months because people are finally starting to, it was like 520, right? The whole world went, huh? When the new standards were published. Um, new uh, International Building Code Standard, new um, NFPA 72 requirement for supervision. We're the only people that have product that meets all the current requirements, all the published requirements for this year. This is a really, really super cool system. Okay, think of what else it could be used for. Think about it, what else it could be used for because we can communicate out. That means you could be running the head end application in your campus police, right? That means a young lady who needs help could be hitting that button right there in the dorm, in the stairwell, whatever the case may be, okay? There are so many things that you can use this kind of technology for. Really, we're only limited by our imagination. And I, and I mean that truly. I spent many, many years in domestic preparedness. And when you do that, you spend about 50% of your time thinking like the bad guy, right? Because I try to think of all the horrible things that could be done to what I am responsible for so I know how to counter them, so I know how to mitigate them, so I know how to plan for them. And this is really kind of like my challenge to you. Where is fire alarm technology going in the 21st century? It's life safety. And it's not just, these are tools, just like Julie mentioned, just like Dave mentioned, just like we've been talking about before. These are tools. I happen to think our toolbox has the best tools and the biggest selection of them, and it gives you the ability to plan for more and deal for more, okay? But you have to think of how you want to leverage these investments, right? And then I know there's a huge challenge. I really feel bad for the, the gentleman who keeps getting picked on because he's the AHJ, right? Because he'd like to go out and tell everybody, 2016, that's the standard we're going to use, right? And then all the people would be pushing back, but we can't afford to do that because then we would have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, keep on going, right? And we all know that's the reality of the situation, right? We all know that's the reality of the situation. The standards aren't changing because there's new cool gee whiz stuff that they want the vendors to be able to sell. The standards are changing because the threat changes. The standards are changing because the technology offers us the ability to do more things with what we have and improve using existing infrastructures, right? And it actually makes it easier and cheaper for us to put in new things because the way we've addressed the new technology. So, there's a couple other things floating out there. I'll just kind of tease you with them, okay? Um, may not, actually it should make a big difference to you because you know you guys sit on like this whole part of the country, the biggest fault line in the United States, right? It's not San Andreas, right? Comes right through the Midwest. Seismic detection, go figure, huh? Believe it or not, um, there's actually folks out there uh, working with the US Geological Survey that we are working with and talking to uh, that can tell you that an earthquake is gonna hit in 20 seconds. Now 20 seconds might not seem like a long time until you figure in 20 seconds I can get away from the big plate glass windows, in 20 seconds I can get into a dorm frame, door, dorm frame, a door frame, into a bathroom, into a place of shelter. That's really, really cool stuff, right? Um, there are a load of other technologies that you are going to see coming with fire alarm systems and security systems, including shot detection, right? I have a little bit of experience with that, both from a system standpoint and a practical standpoint. Shot detection is, this is, a, this is something that not only we need, it's not going to go away, okay? It's unfortunate, but the reality of the situation is the way I look at shot detection technology today, right? This is where the fire alarm technology was 100 years ago, not from a technology standpoint, but from an awareness standpoint. When they first came out with fire protection systems, right, not everybody rushed out and put these in buildings. It's been a long evolution. Shot detection technology is here. We can do this. We can do it really well, okay? Um, but the awareness of do we need to do this, do we need to invest in this, that's where we're still in our infancy, okay? 
And you know who it's going to be driven by? It's going to be driven by you guys. This is absolutely going to be an end user driven push. And it's going to have to be. Um, because unfortunately, like I said, it just gets worse and worse. And as you're thinking about it with that topic, I want to leave you with this thought. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcomplicate it. All right. There's lots of folks out there. There's lots of people out there, consultants, tons of other folks that will give you just flood you with details. Right. But in the end, in the end, a shot detector is going to be like a smoke detector. What does a smoke detector do? What does it do? Detect smoke, right? All right. Does it tell you that you have a fire? Does it tell you how big the fire is? It detects smoke, right? And it detects smoke and it goes to the fire alarm panel and then what happens? The fire alarm system will go off and it will evacuate, right? Now, does it tell you where to evacuate? No, right? What it says is there is a threat to you, move, okay? Think of shot detection in the same way, right? A shot detector picks up a gunshot, bang. It tells people there is a threat to you, move. Run fide height, you'll hear about that this afternoon, right? But there is always a reaction that can come with a warning. The important thing is, this is the bottom line. The warning comes immediately, and emergency services know immediately, right? Biggest advance in fire alarm technology is when our systems started calling the fire departments and saying that there's a fire. Now, what happens when that, in, in that kind of scenario? Occasionally, a false alarm. Are false alarms annoying? Yup, right? But in the end, do you really care? If you put up with a false alarm or two, same thing, right? Same thing, keep that in the back of your head. What if it was a backfire? It wouldn't happen because the technology's evolved beyond that. But in that particular case, who cares? Did the rest of the system work? Did it get the kids out? Wonderful, that was a great drill. That was a great drill, right? And why did you get my kid? Why did you scare my kid? Because I am protecting your kid. And I'm doing it better than any other institution whether it's fire alarm, whether it's shot, I don't care what the threat is, natural disasters, okay? Right, the most important thing that we can do is to protect the constituency that we have. That is the number one responsibility. That's yours from the educational standpoint, that's mine from the manufacturer standpoint, all right? Like I said, I've only been with this company for like three years now, okay? Before that, I was in the field doing the rescue part. All right, I'm an urban search and rescue specialist, right? which means that I dealt with only the real crappy stuff. Okay, Big fire, big structural collapse, people that are buried on just, it, 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 it. The, but the bottom line is, I feel that strongly about our product, right? If we can get people to a safe place and get them away from a threat, it's the most important thing that we can do. And if I can't be out there anymore, trying to get into them, then I can work here trying to get them out to me and kind of put me out of business. You know what I'm saying? Cool. Any questions? And nobody's questions. I ended up doing all the talking. Good, good question. You win. <laughs> yeah, with the LED uh, strobe, the uh, xenon strobe has been all time tested and uh, proven. Yep. And with LED, um, so how confident uh, do you feel with the LED? Super duper confident. Okay, and then after uh, four years, do you have to replace them just because of the LED uh, lumen depreciation or anything? Don't think so. Of course, nobody's had them out there for four, I mean four years, let's go with 10, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, nobody's had them out there doing it for 10 years, but this is what I can tell you. There, there, we, 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 we've got this room, okay? And nobody goes in the room, okay, because you don't want to. Because in the room, there are a whole bunch of strobes going, pff, 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 and that's all they do. And they run, 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 and they run. So, you know what? If it breaks, call me. I'll give you a new one. In fact, the reliability should actually be better. It, it not, it, I mean, it really should. LEDs as a technology themselves are designed for far longer light, life than a, a filament technology like xenon, right? 
I mean, filament is what we had. That, that's what we had in our screw top bulbs, right? And you, how many times did you replace the light bulb, right? All of us were in this boat 10 years ago. I, I mean, every day you're replacing a light bulb in your house. Now the bulbs that we're putting in, they're guaranteeing them for 20 years. Same kind of thing. Um, but kind of like, you know, is my iPhone going to work 20 years from now? Probably not. I, I, I'd like it to, you know, it, but they haven't been around that long, so who knows? Okay. Any others? Yes. Back to the, uh, the TrueCom system. Sure. Um, does that interface directly with the fire alarm systems? No, not today. The TrueCom system is brand new, okay? And it was kind of a Tiger project. All right, essentially my boss came to me and said, uh, we wanna have a brand new system that's gonna meet all of the new requirements when they're published, go do it. And I'm giving you eight months. And I went, uh, blah, 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 right? So I decided to do it in stages. The TrueCom system, the way it is uh, right now today, it's a standalone system. So that bigger panel that's lit up over there, you would have to put it next to your fire alarm panel, okay? The next version of that, and I don't have a date for you, right? I'm, I don't give out dates. Um, no, I, I really don't. The next version of that will be interfaced to the fire alarm control panel, or we call it something new now, right? Fire alarm control, no, FAC, whatever, huh? Emergency command center, yeah. Um, there is a requirement that it needs to like report to a 24 hour manual location. Does it have like the dial out function? Or? It has a dial out function. Yes, okay. it does. Each individual station. Yeah. And they, there's a software package that comes with it. Um, and that software package, so you can locate that in, in as many places as you want. Um, I mean, if, it, if it's this call it, or Notre Dame uh, has their own fire department, could be there, could be your local emergency services, could be police, could be campus police, could be security. Curious if the system is able to, with the area of refuge or the mm -hmm. emergency call, is that able to also send a signal to the security system so that you could actually have that? have the cameras panned to those locations that would monitor that? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it isn't. Again, the version that we came out with, we came out with a version that would meet the existing code the day the code was published. That was my thou shalt make this happen, okay? And we did, and it does a lot more, but the system is not currently designed to interface with either your security system or your fire alarm system. Is it going to do that in the future? Absolutely, the roadmap is there, okay? And when we do do that, it will not require you ripping panels off the wall and putting new ones up, okay? The, it will be the, the, the new pieces to this which is why I won't give you any dates because it's a little harder to work this way. But the new pieces of this will work with the old pieces of this. So when it's time to integrate that, to get it into the pan and zoom, for instance, or get it into the fire alarm control panel down there, right, it will do that. You may need to put another card or something in there, but it will not require that you throw away investment A to go after investment B. So I, I'm out of time. Um, I could spend all day talking to you guys, um, but I'm out of time, but I will be hanging around all day. If anybody wants to talk to me, absolutely um, be more than happy to have a chat with you. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time and attention, and thanks for the invite. <laughs>